Moonies. I've remembered my glasses. You'll be glad to know. This morning we're going to begin phase seven of the inquiry. Yes. And we're going to hear from Mr. Ellison of YouGov. Yeah. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly, sincerely and truly, declare and affirm, declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall give, shall be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Can you state your full name, please? It's Gavin Ellison. Thank you very much, Mr. Ellison. You should have in front of you two witness statements. Um, the first is dated the 17th of September of this year with a URN WITN 11680200. Um, is that statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? That's right. Uh, and that statement exhibits your first report, that's EXPG 607. Perhaps that can be brought onto screen. It's a report of September 2024, and it's 100 pages in length, is that right? That's correct, yes. So, and we'll be looking at that in more detail shortly. You've produced a second witness statement, that's WITN 11680200. Um, is that statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? That's right. Yes, can you see your signature on both of those witness statements? That's right. Thank you. Uh, and that second statement exhibits an addendum report. Can we please turn up onto screen EXPG 609? Uh, and that's entitled Addendum to YouGov Report, also dated September 2024, and that's three pages long. That's correct. Uh, and the second addendum report was produced following questions received by a core participant. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask uh, for you to have both of those reports in front of you. We'll be working on screen from a slightly different document, which just has the tables that have been produced uh, in it, and that is EXPG 608. And perhaps that can be brought onto screen as well. While we're waiting for that, thank you very much. Um, this table, um, this document has on it all of the tables that are produced within your core report. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. That can come down for, for a minute. Um, can you briefly outline your background uh, and your expertise, please? Yes. Yeah, so I'm uh, the head of public sector and not-for-profit research at YouGov. That's a department of around 17 staff and I have 25 years of experience in social research world um, so that uh, includes um, expertise in study design methods questionnaire design um, project management uh, analysis and report writing and I think you worked with a team to compile these surveys and the reports that's right yes YouGov is a name that's familiar to many people, but very briefly, can you tell us who YouGov are? YouGov is an international uh, market research and social research um, uh, agency, um, headquartered in the United Kingdom, UK registered uh, company, uh, with over a thousand staff around the globe um, at the moment. Um, and we've been operating since the early 2000s. Before we go to the results of the surveys, I just want to ask you about methodology. You produced two questionnaires, one that went to sub-postmasters uh, and one that went to applicants to the historic shortfall scheme. Is that right? That's right, yeah. You say at page nine of your main report that YouGov used their experience and judgment to ensure that all questions uh, were asked in a fair and balanced way. Uh, typically, how might you do that? Well, typically for a, for a process of questionnaire um, development, looking at um, 
ideas for questions and then working those up into fair and balanced questions where we might be looking for things like um, uh, whether a question it could be leading or not, whether the scales are balanced, such as, as an example, a satisfaction question, um, rather than state that, a, a, rather than the question wording being, how satisfied are you with X, Y, and Z? It should really read, how satisfied or dissatisfied are you with uh, X, Y, and Z? And that the satisfaction scale in that example goes from, is balanced, so it has, for example, very satisfied, quite satisfied, a neutral um, uh, option, and then very dis uh, uh, quite dissatisfied, very dissatisfied. So a five-point uh, balanced uh, scale. Also, in the wording of questions, where you might see something like, um, uh, "Which of the following uh, have happened?" It should really read something like, "Which of the following, if any, have happened?" So we're not presuming that certain things have happened when they may not have happened. So really in that, that process that we went through over a number of iterations of designing the questionnaires, we were looking to make sure that those questions were worded in a very neutral um, and inclusive way. Thank you. One core participant has referred to uh, the potential for something called voluntary response bias. Um, what do you understand by that and to what extent might that play a part in the response? Um, well, I mean, it, the, the only survey that's, that's compulsory is the census, so we aren't reliant on uh, people taking part um, in, in the survey. The, um, that element of, of voluntary or, or often called non-response bias is perhaps a, a sense that those who didn't respond to the survey might have very different reviews to those that, uh, that, that did respond. Um, there's a number of things that we need to do to try to make sure that everyone has a chance to respond who can, and we follow those processes and best practice um, in the sense that we um, invited everyone that we had access to through an online um, email uh, method. We repeated that through a couple of reminders. We also sent everyone on our lists uh, an email, a letter. Um, so those who didn't have an email address would have received a letter which contained a link so the idea is just to be as inclusive as, as, as we possibly uh, can when we're uh, inviting everyone to take part in the survey. The fieldwork period uh, was between the 18th of July and the 15th of August of this year, is that correct? That's right. Is that a typical or reasonable period for fieldwork? I think allowing at least three weeks is considered to be generally good for best practice purposes. So that, uh, that did allow for that to happen. And we did have to factor in that we were sending people letters in addition to sending them email requests to take part. Thank you. Could we please turn to the core report? That's EXPG 607 and page 9. This chart does appear in our other document, but I also want to take you over the page and the breakdown on the next page doesn't appear. So we'll, we'll use the report just to look at this first one. It's page nine. Um, the chart there halfway down the page shows the completion rate, those uh, who completed the questionnaire. For the sub-postmaster, current sub-postmaster questionnaire, do we see there uh, 1,015 people responded? That's right. And for the HSS, um, Historic Shortfall Scheme applicants, there were 1,483. That's right. Um, not all of those who started the survey finished, and we see there in the box to the left the numbers who didn't totally complete the form. Is that That's correct, correct yeah. Um, do you consider the number of respondents to be statistically significant for the purposes of a survey? Uh, yes, to have those those two uh, numbers for them to be over a thousand is uh, is very useful. Um, the response rate to the HSS applicant survey is very strong. I would say to get anywhere near fifty percent of those who are invited is is very strong. Um, it's it's not strictly uh, applicable to this type of survey, which was a census rather than a random probability sample. But you can use an indicative margin of error, for example, that might help in, in considering the results. 
So for something that is approaching uh, 1,500 responses, we'll be looking at a plus or minus of 2.5% from the true uh, population. And for the survey of, uh, of uh, current and uh, uh, sub-postmasters, uh, that would be around plus or minus 3%. Um, I would have liked the response rate to be higher from the sub-postmasters um, side. There's no doubt about that, but um, still having over 1,000 there is, is very um, helpful. Are you aware of any reasons why the HSS applicant uh, response rate might be higher than current sub-postmasters? Uh, the methods that were applied are exactly the same for both. Um, as I've explained, the, the, uh, the email um, uh, invites and a letter uh, approach and the repeating of reminders by email, that was exactly the same. Um, so I, uh, there's nothing within the method that would suggest why that is... Um, why it's lower for current sub-postmasters. So you're just speculating about levels of engagement from the current sub-postmasters. And, and then the, the, nature of the, um, the nature of the questionnaire and the subjects that are being covered, applicants to the scheme are clearly feeling that it's something that they wanted to reply to in greater numbers, greater proportions than the current sub-postmasters. Thank you. Um, over the page, please, we can see that you've broken down um, by various factors, the responses. Looking at the current sub-postmasters, it seems there that there are slightly more males than females responding, or, or it may simply be that there are more males than females in the sub-postmaster cohort. Uh, they, they could be, yeah. Uh, I, don't think we, uh, I don't think we know the, the full population demographics of current sub-postmasters. Uh, looking at the age, uh, it looks as though they are um, larger in number towards the higher uh, ages. Yes, that's right. So slightly older. Yes. In terms of ethnicity, 59% um, said that they were white, 34% reported as ethnic minorities. Yep, that's correct. I think you've also said in the report that those from ethnic minorities tended to be younger. Is that correct? That's right, yes. When we're looking at... Um, uh, the analysis by those demographic variables, we do have to be careful sometimes that something that could look as if it is um, uh, a difference that is uh, between ethnicities could actually be driven potentially more by the age difference. Uh, so where we see s certain results, that might have impacted on that. Yes, the report does make that clear when we believe that that could be happening. And we see there in terms of regions, 78% of respondents were from England. Yes. Uh, and 87% were from a single branch. So a, lot, a, m near, a very significant proportion um, were sub-postmasters operating one branch only. Yes. If we go over the page, please, we can see the breakdown of responses from the HSS survey. Very similar in terms of male to female ratios. Before we had 54% to male. Here we have 57%. 66% are, are over the age of 60, uh, and that was compared to 36% of the current sub-postmaster respondents. So the respondents to the historic shortfall scheme survey tended to be older, is that right? That's right. Uh, in terms of ethnicity, 68% reported um, that they were white, 28% reported uh, as being from an ethnic minority. A slightly higher percentage of ethnic minorities in the current sub-postmaster cohort compared to the historic shortfall scheme survey, is that right? That's right. And does that fit in with the analysis in terms of age group and perhaps um, the amount of time that they have been a sub-postmaster for? Uh, yes, that's, that's correct. And of course, there is, um, within the report, you'll see references to the length of time at which they've been a sub-postmaster. Um, and of course, that is obviously correlated with their age. Thank you. Very similar proportions to current sub-postmasters in terms of the regions, if we scroll down slightly. Let's start now by looking at the sub-postmaster survey. That's covered in chapter four of your report. Um, it's page 13 where it begins, but let's bring up onto screen, please, um, EXPG 608. Uh, 
Uh, and we begin by looking at training. If we go on to figure two, so over there to page, please. Um, this is the headline analysis of training. Um, is the headline really that we see here at the bottom that 66% uh, plus 33%, that's 99% of respondents had received training at some point? Uh, yes, the figures on the screen are, uh, have been moved around. So. Pardon? So the figures on the screen are not, do not match the, um, the line up from the, the chart, the original chart. The figures I'm looking on the screen here have got decimal points. Ah, yes. Um, and the alignment of the, uh, of the options is not correct. So perhaps if, if we turn back to EXPG 607, Maybe we'll just work off of the actual report itself. It's page 14. I think it's only that chart that that affects. Okay. If we could turn to page 14, please. So there at the bottom, if we, we, we can see net any training, nearly everybody who responded has received some sort of training at some point. That's right. Is there anything else that stands out in respect of that chart? Uh, no, I mean, uh, important things to remember sometimes in, in, in the questionnaire and the report are that, that this, is, um, this is what people are recalling having received as well. So this is always this is all recall. Um, so there's people remembering um, that they have received um, training. Um, Let, let's move on, please. If we go back then to... Um, EXPG 608 and figure three, so that's page three, will then move on. Um, sub postmasters were then asked about the content of their training, types of training. Mostly, uh, they could tick all of the boxes, couldn't they? In this? That's right, it's a multiple choice response. 88% um, received training on general transactions, uh, for example, carrying out day-to-day -day transactions. High numbers for balancing as well, but much smaller numbers when it came to uh, matters such as dealing with discrepancies, use of the suspense account, uh, dealing with technical issues. That's right. So yes, it's useful here to remember again about this is them recalling. So it's often, um, I would suspect, what's at the top of their mind, what they remember about the training were those key um, ones at the top there, the general tracks, transactions and the balancing. They're the ones that stuck in, in people's minds from the training they'd received. And if we turn now to figure four, respondents were asked about their satisfaction levels in, in respect of the training. Uh, we see there red is net dissatisfaction, uh, purple is net satisfaction, um, a much larger number uh, of the net dissatisfied. Is that right? That's right. 42% versus 25%. 30% they're neither satisfied nor dissatisfied. Um, and I think you've said in your report that the 42% net dissatisfied figure uh, rises to 50% uh, amongst those aged between 50 and 59. Uh, that's right, yes. yes. Thank you. Could we turn now to figure five, please? Uh, and this drills down further and looks at length of service. Uh, can you assist us with this chart? Yeah, so this is uh, general satisfaction with the training that was received, uh, broken down by the length of time working. Um, the length of time working is one of those things that immediately stands out when you look in the data in terms of the um, key differences in the way that people are responding to the survey. Um, and there is a very consistent pattern whereby those with uh, less uh, experience who have been working for a, a shorter amount of time, typically two years or less or five years or less, do tend to be generally more satisfied than those with longer experience of being a sub-postmaster, and this is a, an indication of that. So those with the highest levels of satisfaction with the training were those who have been in post for two years or less. 
and it steadily uh, decreases with a length of time of being a, a sub-postman. You obviously can't say for sure, but this might indicate, uh, mightn't it, that training has improved in recent years, potentially. Um, it, it could. It could also be related to training that's received soon after becoming uh, as the sub-postmaster. I would, I would uh, guess that that's more likely to have happened, and therefore it might be fresher in their minds, potentially. Let's leave training and move on to operation of the Horizon system. And can we please look at figure six, please? This looks at overall satisfaction with the Horizon system. And the question at the bottom there, we see overall how satisfied or dissatisfied are you with the Horizon IT system? Um, a lot of red in this example. Uh, yes. It's kind of similar to the previous uh chart, but yes, around a, only around a quarter would say they're satisfied with the current system in operation. And we have there 25% are uh, or responded that they were very dissatisfied. Yes, that's right. And there is the same uh, um, dynamic in terms of the length of service as well. Uh, and what do you mean by that? Well, so those who are have been working for two years or less, uh, they, 37% uh, of them are satisfied with the Horizon system, and that compares to the 25% that we see for the response group as a whole. Um, and as the length of time being a sub postmaster is longer, um, the dissatisfaction levels uh, rise. And we can see that actually if we turn over the page to figure seven. Uh, those are the figures there. So satisfaction levels slightly improve if you look at those who have only worked for two years or less. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, but is it also right to say that in every age category there were more dissatisfied than there were satisfied? That's true, yes, even those who have uh, fewer than two years of service. Yes. Thank you. Could we turn over the page, please, to figure eight? Um, respondents were then asked about issues experienced on the Horizon system in the last 12 months, and this provides that analysis, does it? That's right, so again, a multiple choice of issues that have been experienced so in the last could, year. They could tick as many boxes yes. as they wanted. Um, if we look at the top four, over half uh, of respondents experienced at least one of screen fee freezes, loss of connection, issues with pin pad, and unexplained discrepancies. Is that correct? That's right. And only if we look at the bottom, we have the 6% um, who haven't experienced and the 2% who don't know or can't remember. Uh, yes. Could I ask you, we won't turn it up on screen, but if you could turn to page 18 of your first report. I think... Um, you report there about sub-postmasters mentioning issues within open-ended comments. C could you explain that for us, please? Uh, yes, so uh, searching through the, the comments to, to look for um, those who are talking about the current operation of the Horizon system, uh, we have, can find a number of comments. There's one that is, uh, that's detailed there, which says, in my opinion, Horizon is still flawed. I regularly have unexplained discrepancies, often altering daily or manifesting at balance. Um, so these were boxes within the survey where people could type in uh, any response. That's right. Um, and, and if you continue looking at your own report on page 19, you've carried out some further analysis that isn't shown on this chart. Are you able to assist us with that, please? Uh, that, that's right, yes. So there, there is a connection, of course, between um, the discrepancies, no, the, the issues that are being experienced and the level of current satisfaction with the system, as you might um, expect. So those who are um, experiencing particular types of issues are uh, less likely to be satisfied with the, um, the system. So in the report, it states that 81% um, of those who are satisfied with the system um, still reported experiencing an issue, but that these issues tended to be things like the screen freezes, the loss of connection, um, and issues with the pin pad, which might be more, perhaps considered to be less serious um, issues. 
the, um, those who were dissatisfied with the current operation of the system, they were much more likely uh, than others to report issues such as unexplained discrepancies, um, unexplained transactions, missing transactions, and double uh, entry of transactions. So there's a, a difference there between um, those who are experiencing the different types of issues and their resultant satisfaction with the current system. And if we look on that page, page 19, towards the bottom, you also have carried out some analysis in terms of frequency. Mm. Uh, is it right to say that I think 65% of those who have experienced problems in the last 12 months have experienced those on a monthly basis? That's right, yes. 16% uh, a few times a week, 6% uh, once a week, um, and then, yeah, more on there a few times a month and once a month. Thank you. So a majority of those who responded uh, reported experiencing issues on a monthly basis? Um, well, the, a majority of those who, uh, the majority of those who responded reported issues, and then two thirds of those who reported issues reported that that was happening on a monthly basis. Thank you. Uh, moving on now to advice and assistance. That's page 21 of your report. Can you assist us with your initial findings there on page 21 before we move on to figure nine? Yeah, so this is a, a section where we uh, asked questions about the business support center. And uh, we found that nearly, all, nearly everyone who responded had uh, contacted the business support center in the last 12 months. 97% of those who responded had done so. Um, and it was quite common for them to be doing so uh, at least once a month. So 52% had called at least once a month. Thank you. Let's turn to figure nine, please. Uh, and this sets out the reasons why people have called or reported calling the helpline. Uh, once again, they could give uh, multiple reasons. Is that correct? Yes, multiple choice uh, question. And if we look there, we can see 76% called as a result of a technical issue, 46% as a result of a balancing issue. And That's then right. smaller figures for those other responses. Yes. At page 22, just below that chart, you have given some more detail and broken that down a little more. Are you able to assist us with that, please? Yeah, so there was a, uh, a follow-up question to that because we were interested in whether they felt that the response they'd received was um, tailored to the issue that they'd been experiencing or whether they felt that they were being a, given a generic um, response, um, uh, which uh, resulted in quite a, an even split. 45% uh, felt that the advice they'd received was tailored and 53% felt that it was a very generic response they were given. And there were some differences um, uh, in terms of whether they felt the advice was tailored, uh, some differences in, in terms of age and ethnicity um, and in um, satisfaction. So again, an interesting link with those who are uh, currently satisfied with the system, um, those who felt they were given some tailored advice, 64% of them were satisfied with the system, 34% uh, of them were dissatisfied. So, so in your view, you've set out a number of bullet points, but the one that stands out there is that those satisfied with the Horizon system, um, it was 64% versus 34% uh, of those who were dissatisfied. Yes, so there's a, there's a clear link there between they, they've been given tailored advice rather than uh, generic um, advice. And given that nearly everyone is contacting the business support center, that's clearly an important element. Thank you. Could we please turn to figure 10? That's over the page. This addresses overall satisfaction with the business support centre. Um, th this is, I think, the first, possibly the first case where we have more of the purple than the red. We have 42% net satisfied uh, against 26% dissatisfied. Is that correct? That's right. I think you've said at page 22... Uh, that a slightly lower percentage of those uh, from, were from an ethnic minority background that were satisfied? Um, that's correct, yes. So the, the score for the satisfied <coughs> was 45 for those from a white background and 37 for those from an ethnic minority background. 
And this uh, further reinforces the importance of the tailored advice because 71% of those who received tailored advice were satisfied with the business support center um, service compared to just 17% of those who felt that they had had a generic uh, response. Thank you very much. Uh, moving now to transaction corrections. And figure 11, please. 81% um, reported receiving a transaction correction in the last 12 months, is that right? That's correct. Yes. Uh, and if we please turn to figure 12, it looks at those who have disputed transaction corrections. 46% have disputed at least uh, one in the last 12 months, is that correct? That's right. I think you've analyzed this at page 24 of your report. And you've said that younger sub-postmasters and those from ethnic minority backgrounds were more likely to fall within that 46 percent. Uh, that's correct, yes. So the younger uh, sub-postmasters aged uh, 18 to 39, uh, 68 percent of them um, had, uh, had done that uh, disputing. And um, those from the ethnic minority backgrounds, 58 percent. And those who had been a sub-postmaster for two years or less, it was 63 percent. If we turn over the page, please, to figure 13 and 14. Um, 13 and 14 look at satisfaction levels with elements of the transaction corrections process. Let's look at figure 13 first. Uh, can you assist us with that? Uh, yes. So um, with 13, I mean, nearly everyone who took part had uh, the ability to, to uh, respond to this uh, question. So they were asked about um, their satisfaction with the review or dispute ROD function and their level of satisfaction in terms of their access to having sufficient data to be able to uh, review or dispute transaction corrections. And for both of those elements, um, they felt that they were, there was more dissatisfaction than there was satisfaction. And if we look at the, the, the top one, um, broadly, equal numbers between satisfied and dissatisfied for the review or dispute function itself. Yes. But then if you look at the access to sufficient data, uh, there is great, far greater dissatisfaction uh, with the access to data. That's correct, yes. Thank you. If we look at now at figure 14 over the page, this just looks at those who have disputed a transaction correction in the last 12 months. And first, it looks at uh, whether respondents were satisfied with the outcome. And we have there 40% net dissatisfied uh, against 33% satisfied. Yes, yeah, so this goes through the outcome and then the response that was received and how long it took uh, to respond. And it looks there as though the, there is a higher level of uh, dissatisfaction with the response received after raising the dispute than in respect of the outcome of the transaction. So the second one, there is a higher level of dissatisfaction compared to the first, for example. That's right. Uh, and there is, if we go down, uh, even greater level of dissatisfaction with how long it took the post office to respond. Yes, that's the element with the highest level of dissatisfaction. Turning now to the issue of discrepancies, and that's page 28 of your report. Um, can you assist us with um, some analysis that you've carried out at the very top of page 28, please? Yes, so 69% of those surveyed reported that they had experienced an unexplained discrepancy since uh, the point of January 2020. Um, those who uh, had been working for longer uh, were the most likely to have experienced uh, something. Uh, those who... Um, uh, and then uh, among that group, uh, we looked into the frequency with which that was happening. Thank you. Could we bring onto screen, please, figure 15? So that's page 15 of EXPG 607. Uh, and that addresses the frequency of unexplained discrepancies. Thank you. It's figure 15. OK, 
Oh, sorry, it's EXPG 608. If we scroll down, thank you very much. Uh, so this addresses the frequency of unexplained discrepancies. Most common in this box was um, a couple of times a year, uh, followed by once every two to three months. Is that right? We see there 25% for a couple of times a year, 21% once every two to three months. That's right. Um, but then on the left-hand side, we see there are a few times a month and at least once a month. Um, so that's 17 and 18%. Adding those two together on the left-hand side, we get 35% of respondents uh, who e experienced an unexplained discrepancy once a month or more than once a month. Is, is that uh, yes, right? Sorry, yes, sorry, yes. Thank you. Um, could we please turn to figure 16? And this looks at those who have experienced an unexplained discrepancy and it provides the amount of atypical discrepancy that they may receive. Half of those were less than 200 pounds or half of the typical discrepancies were less than 200 pounds, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Um, and if we add, for example, the 50%, the 39% and the 5%, uh, we see there that 89% reported that a typical discrepancy is less than £1,000. Sorry, £1,999. Yes, if you add the first two, the less than 200 and the, um, so less than 1,000. There eight. are some figures that are above £2,000, although considerably small enough. Very, very few, yes. Um, we have there 1% between 5,000 and 9,000, so five. Thousand and nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine. You also have one percent uh, above thirty thousand. Yes. If you could have a look at the bottom of page twenty eight in your report, I think you say that ninety eight percent of those reporting discrepancies reported shortfalls. Uh, Thirty four percent also reported surpluses. Yes, we were interested in. Obviously, it's a multiple choice, so whether they were shortfalls or whether there'd been any experience of surpluses as well. So nearly all of them had experienced shortfalls. Um, a third had had some surpluses, though. Thank you. Um, could we turn over, please, to figure 17? And this looks at how discrepancies were resolved. Um, and we see there the most significant figure is a sub-postmaster resolving it themselves or through using the branch's own money. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, does anything else stand out there for you? Um, yes, I mean, there, there's some analysis of uh, yeah, within that. So the most likely group to be resolving it using their own um, uh, old branches money was those with the 11 to 20 years of service. So the slightly um, uh, longer servicing, longer serving postmasters. Um, and those who were using the business support center was also significantly linked to the length of service. Um, so it was much more, uh, much more popular route among those with uh, uh, more recent, um, who had more recently become sub postmasters. So among those who had more recently become 38% uh, had followed that route compared to the 19% um, overall. Whereas that group who had been serving for 11 to 20 years, just 11% of them had followed the uh, business support centre route. Thank you. Turning, please, to figure 18, you then look at satisfaction levels regarding the resolution of discrepancies, and you have um, significantly more net dissatisfied than you have net satisfied. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, yes. I think at page... 30, um, you've also broken that down and highlighted that those who served as a sub-postmaster for five years or less were more likely to be satisfied. That's right, yes. Yeah. So it's the same pattern that we've seen previously. Uh, but again, still net dissatisfied. Still net dissatisfied. Um, moving now to suspension and termination, and that's 
page 31 of your report. Can you assist us? Uh, you have some analysis at the top of page 31 that isn't, I don't think, addressed by the figure below. Uh, that's right. So yes, 86% um, had never been either suspended or threatened with um, suspension. Um, but 4% reported that they had been suspended and reinstated and 8% uh, reported that they had been threatened with suspension. Uh, and how about in terms of um, ethnic minorities? Yes, yeah, so that varies a little bit. So looking within the 8% who had been uh, threatened with suspension, um, so that figure for uh, white respondents was 5%, whereas it was 12% uh, for those from an ethnic minority background, and it was in fact 17% of those with an Asian uh, British uh, ethnic minority background. Uh, are you able to comment in, in any way as to whether those differences are statistically significant? So they would be indicatively significant, yes. Uh, and significant of what, sorry? Uh, so the, the difference between the percentages is would be considered statistically significant um, if we were following that the path of statistical significance. Thank you. And page 31 also says that sub-postmasters from a minority ethnic background is more likely than a white sub-postmaster uh, to have been suspended and reinstated. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, yes. I think it, the figures there were 6% versus 2%. Uh, yes, that's right. I mean, as a general point, things that are mentioned in the report, uh, with differences between subgroups would only be in the report if the differences between them are large enough to be considered to be statistically significant. Thank you very much. Um, figure 19 drills that down a little by length of service. Can you assist us with that, please? Uh, yes. So this, um, this is the, the, the point at which they have been, uh, uh, how recent that was. So it's, it's a group of only just over 100 who had been um, either suspended or threatened with suspension. And for 5% of that group of just over 100, that was within the last 12 months. Um, the, the largest uh, group there for whom that had happened was the 38% um, column that you can see there. For, uh, and for that group, it had happened uh, 11 years or more ago. So there seems to be quite a jump um, from four years onwards in terms of length of service as to those who reported having been suspended or threatened with suspension. Is that correct? Uh, that's right. Yes. I think at page 31, you've also noted that 77% of those who reported being suspended or threatened with suspension were dissatisfied with how it was handled. That's correct, and 4% satisfied with the handling of it. Thank you. In your second report, you, you've addressed a specific question. Um, can I please take you, um, we don't need to bring it up onto screen, but the page two of your second report, and it's the first and second questions, taking them one by one. If we look at the first question, can you assist us with that follow-up question in your analysis? Uh, yes, so we were asked whether there was sufficient data uh, within the in the survey to compare those who had been suspended or threatened with suspension with those who had experienced uh, unexplained discrepancies. So in our response to that, um, to that question, uh, we explained that the, the two subjects of the suspension and the uh, dis unexplained discrepancies, they did come in separate parts of the questionnaire. They're not, co they're not linked um, in terms of um, being able to, to, to see uh, whether the unexplained discrepancies was uh, led, in fact, to, to suspension. So we can't do that. Um, we can only identify uh, a correlation between them, not, certainly not causation. There were actually only eight um, who were surveyed who reported being suspended or threatened with suspension um, in the last three years, uh, and all of those had experienced an unexplained discrepancy. Um, but we have to remember that quite a lot of those responding to the survey had uh, experienced an unexplained uh, discrepancy since January 2020. Um, so it, it's an interesting thing to look at, but we, we can't see that there's any um, causation going on between those two factors. And the second question on that page, uh, there was another issue that was addressed. Yeah, so we, we were asked if there was uh, anything within the open-ended comments or any additional information about uh, whether um, 
about what the cause of suspension could be and whether it was related to discrepancies. Um, so looking through uh, all of the detailed uh, responses that, that were provided, there were some examples that we've, that we've provided in that addendum of comments that related to um, uh, threats of suspension or suspension uh, that were also connected to the issue of discrepancies. And we've provided three examples of those um, in this addendum. Thank you very much. Um, let's move to the topic of audits. And can we please look at, if you look at page 32 of your report. Um, can you assist us there? Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the question was asked whether uh, since January 2020, uh, there had been um, an audit for the branch, and 78% um, said that they had not um, had an audit. 12% reported there had been one um, audit of, of the branch. And I um, think it was more likely for those who had been a sub postmaster for only two years. That's correct, yeah, very clear difference right. there for the newer uh, sub postmasters. Um, so the numbers that we're reporting are very low in terms of those who had received a branch audit. Yes, so 152 of those who responded had received um, at least one audit since January 2020. Thank you. And if we look at figure 20, please, that addresses the issue of satisfaction with how the audits have been conducted. Uh, and actually, there were 57% who were net dis uh, satisfied, only 21% who were um, net dissatisfied. Yes, that's right. Again, I mean, there, there it seems to be a trend in a lot of these answers uh, with greater satisfaction levels who, uh, for those newer sub-postmasters. Is that a fairer? That's correct, all the way through, yes. Um, the sub-postmaster contract, that's addressed at figure 21. Um, the questions here looked at whether sub-postmasters had received their contract and also when they had received their contract. Um, this question was, uh, if we see at the bottom, were you sent a copy of your contract um, before or after the beginning your current role? Overwhelming majority had received a copy of their contract. Yes, that's right. I think you've provided some more analysis at page 33. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the, the recall of, of having received a contract um, um, there was a, a difference there with the age group. Um, so those aged uh, 59 to, sorry, 50 to 59, 23% of them, and uh, those aged 60 plus, 21% uh, of, of that group were uh, more likely than uh, the younger uh, age group to have received a copy of the contract after beginning the, the role. After beginning their role? Yes, yes. after beginning the role. Could we turn now to figure 22? And this addresses the receipt of a contract after the Bates and Post Office Common Issues judgment. Uh, sub postmasters were asked if they had received a copy after that judgment. And, and it seems there that a far greater proportion had not received a copy after the Common Issues judgment than had received a copy. Yes, that's right. In comparison, 53% said that they could not uh, recall having received that. Thank you. And that's just receiving the contract. If we look at figure 23, that addresses receipt of guidance um, after the Bates judgment. Yes. So that's, that's the whole uh, sample group again answering the question whether they've received uh, guidance. And a very significant proportion ha had not received any guidance. That's right, they could not recall um, that. 71% so uh, said they hadn't received any guidance, only 8% had received any guidance. Yes, again, there's that um, quite significant difference in terms of, the, of how recent they became a sub-postmaster. Uh, and can you assist us with that? Um, yes, so those who had been the, in the role for um, 11 to 20 years um, and those who had been 21 years or more uh, were more likely than those who had been serving for less time to report that they had not received any additional information. So one comparison there would be that um, 
38% of those who had been serving for less than two years uh, could uh, re recall uh, receiving something. And, uh, and, and that's uh, that obviously in comparison, just 8% of the overall sample group. Thank you. Turning now to figure 24, and that addresses the fairness of the contract. Uh, Sub-postmasters were asked how fair they considered the, their contract to be. 32% um, found it to be very unfair. Uh, net unfair was significantly more than net fair, is that? Uh, that's correct, yes. And the, the longer uh, they had been serving, the more likely they were to feel that it was unfair. Um, can you assist us with that analysis? Yes, so those who have been serving for uh, 11 to 20 years, 62% of them felt that it was unfair, and 60% uh, of those who have been serving for longer than 20 years felt that it's unfair. Thank you. Um, moving to the next topic, which was whistleblowing and complaints, that's figure 25. Uh, this figure addresses awareness of whistleblowing and complaints mechanisms. Uh, and what does this show us? Yeah, so uh, general awareness about the ability to complain was, uh, was low. Uh, just over half uh, were not aware about the ability to raise a whistleblowing concern with the post office. That would be the uh, third, uh, the, the bar at the bottom, the 55% um, group there. Um, so we have there, the, the red is I was not aware of this at all. Uh, and the one slightly to the left of the red is, I was aware of this, uh, but would not know how to do it. That's right. If you add those in each of those categories, so uh, about complaining about a business support manager or area manager, uh, complaining about treatment by the post office, or raising a whistleblowing issue with the post office, um, in some cases you're getting towards 80% of respondents either, either not being aware at all or not being aware of how to do it. That's right, yes. Thank you. Could we turn to figure 26? Uh, and this shows satisfaction levels from those who had complained. Uh, now, uh, as you've just said, not a, a great proportion of people actually knew how to complain. So this number is quite small of those who were analysed. Is that correct? Yes, this needs to be treated with a lot of caution because it's around about 50 uh, of the responses that relate to this question. Uh, and again, a fair amount of red there for net dissatisfaction outweighing net satisfaction. Yes, that's right. Yeah, more significantly in terms of the um, when they had been complained about the way that they had been treated by the post office rather than the way that they had complained about being treated by a business support manager or an area manager. Could we next um, have a look at the po post office senior leadership? There are a series of questions addressing the senior leadership and management of the post office. And it's figure 27. Um, looks at the uh, two sub-postmaster non-executive directors. We're going to be hearing from them as our next witnesses. Um, awareness, general awareness of the sub-postmaster non-executive directors is high, 72%. Is that correct? Um, so yes, but very yes, relatively few are um, uh, are, un are unaware of that. And I think at thirteen, page thirty-nine, um, you address the question of whether um, sub postmasters believe that they shared board information with them. Um, yes, yes, that's right. So uh, yes, a majority uh, disagreed that those who are serving on the board have shared information with them. Um, only around 15% uh, agreed that they have been doing that. Turning over to figure 28, please. This looks at the overall board. And again, a fair amount of red there. Can you assist us with the, those results, please? Uh, yes, so this is uh, the... Um, general perceptions of, uh, of what the, 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 the board and what the post office, um, uh, uh, in terms of the relationship, the concerns, um, that the views are being listened to. And it ranges from a high in terms of agreement uh, in relation to a belief that the post office is trying to improve its relationship. Uh, there's 30% who agree with that, 51% disagree. 
and that uh, drops to uh, a low of 11% agreement with views uh, being listened to at the board level and 60% uh, disagreeing with, um, with that. So in terms of headlines from this figure, uh, the most significant net disagree is, is that the post office limited understands the concerns of sub postmasters. Uh, that's that's right. Yeah, and this one is a, a good example again about the differences between length of service. Um, so to give you an example, the those who have uh, less than two years uh, length of service, 30% of them um, would uh, disagree about the uh, trying to improve the relationship with the sub postmasters. So significantly uh, lower levels of disagreement um, there with, with that one from the 51%. Um, whereas those with uh, six years plus service are more likely than the 51% to disagree, they would be 55% in disagreement about improving the relationship. Thank you. Finally, in terms of the current sub-postmaster survey, there were a series of questions about being a sub-postmaster now. And if we could turn to figure 29, what do we see there? So on, on this one, the, the question being how satisfied or dissatisfied are you in your role as a sub-postmaster now, 31% uh, were satisfied and 48% uh, um, dissatisfied. There's much higher levels of dissatisfaction among men than women. That's an interesting uh, difference there. 53% of, of uh, men dissatisfied compared to 43% of women. Thank you. And you've also drilled down into satisfaction and dissatisfaction by years of service. That's figure 30. And can you assist us with that, please? Uh, yeah, so this, this shows the, uh, the split uh, between um, satisfied and dissatisfied with the current role. And um, for, the, for those who have uh, been most recently um, uh, appointed, uh, up to the point of uh, five years, more are satisfied than are dissatisfied uh, with their role. But it's after that five-year point that those uh, who have been a sub postmaster for longer tended to be um, dissatisfied rather than satisfied with their role. Thank you. And if we finally look at figure 31, actually, sorry, there are, there are two more. Figure 31 looks at to what extent do you feel valued or undervalued by Post Office Limited? A much higher number uh, in terms of the red. 72% net undervalued, only 14% net valued. Uh, yes, and again, that, that difference by length of service. So those who have served for less than two years, their undervalued percentage would be 50%. Um, those with 20 plus years service would be 76%. That 76% being significantly more undervalued or feeling more Fe Feeling undervalued, undervalued, yes. So, yeah, the, the percentages here are, uh, yes, more negative than the general satisfaction with the role. And if we look at this chart in front of us, there is a considerable proportion that actually are in the very extreme category, the very undervalued as opposed to the fairly undervalued. That's right, yes. Uh, and very finally, for the sub-postmaster survey, we have figure 32. And can you assist us with that, please? Yeah, so this one placed four aspects of um, uh, perceptions of the post office limited. The learning lessons from the past was the one with the uh, highest level of agreement but still just 26% compared to 55% who disagreed. Um, being a good place to work, the figure was slightly lower. Um, being considered to be trustworthy, just 17% um, felt that compared to 65% who disagreed. And in terms of their perceptions of whether it's professionally managed, 15% compared to 68%. Um, um, some of those uh, big differences, again, in terms of length of service, though, so to give one example of that, being uh, considered trustworthy, for those who have uh, served for less than two years, 38% uh, would agree that it was trustworthy, but still 45% would have said, would have disagreed uh, with being uh, 
trustworthy. So generally slightly more positive from those who had served for less time or at the very bottom category of time, uh, two years or less, but That's still correct. net dissatisfied. Or net yes, the, the one that was probably most positive among that newer group was it being considered as being a good place to work. So an example there would be 47% of those with less than two years service agreed that it's a good place to work compared to 31% who disagreed uh, with that. Thank you. And in terms of headline, from the figure that we currently see on screen, um, the bottom one seems to be the smallest in terms of agreement and largest in terms of net disagreement, and that is that the post office is professionally managed. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Uh, page 43 of your report, uh, and over the page... And over the page again, you've briefly uh, summed up um, some open answers, or you've quoted from some open answers to various questions. Are you able to assist us with any themes that emerge there? Yes, yeah, so uh, at the end of the survey, we wanted to provide everyone who had taken part with a chance to say whatever they wanted to, to say, to talk about things that hadn't been um, discussed uh, previously. And we have done some a simple sort of thematic uh, analysis of, of those comments that were made. Um, the, the, the main things that we would, uh, we would point out um, were feelings of uh, being undervalued, uh, underrepresented, um, issues with current issues with the system and insufficient training, uh, possibly a lack of support and transparency from senior leaders as well. Many also mentioned uh, a feeling uh, that the reason they felt undervalued was often because they were simply not being paid enough for the work that they were doing um, and the hours that they were putting in, and that's a lack of uh, feeling valued and a lack of recognition. Um, and so we have given, uh, you'll see within the report, some indicative comments that express those key themes that, that continue to, to, um, to be stated. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to now move on to the Horizon Shortfall Scheme survey. It might be an appropriate moment to yes. take our first morning break. By all means. Thank you. So what time shall we resume? Just after 10 past, 11 minutes past. Thank you. Moving on to the Horizon Shortfall Scheme Applicant Survey, um, we've already discussed that you received 1,483 responses. Um, you begin at page 46 of your substantive report, uh, and there you say that there are similar numbers um, to those who received compensation uh, to those who the process had not yet concluded. Is that correct? That's right. Yes, roughly, uh, roughly the same proportion um, had had the process concluded as to those who were still going in the process. Um, if we look at page 47, there's just one point that I'd like to ask you about, and it's um, the second paragraph, the final sentence. It says, 70% of those who have applied to the scheme but said it had not yet concluded had applied recently post-October 2022. Um, so are we to understand by that that that's looking at only approximately half of the respondents to this survey because half had already received compensation and that of that half, 70% um, had applied after October 2022? Uh, that's right, yes. Thank you. Um, could we bring back onto um, the screen the various figures in EXPG 608 and we're going to start on page 33. Figure 33 identifies where applicants had heard about the historic shortfall scheme. And we see they're most commonly um, receiving a letter from Post Office Limited or from Herbert Smith Freehills. That's right, yeah, again, a multiple choice list. So there may be some repetition. Yes. I think, thank you. 
Um, paragraph, uh, figure 34, please, so the next chart. This looked at which, if any, of the following do you remember receiving after making the application? Um, and the most significant number there, 76% recalled receiving an acknowledgement of their application, uh, but far fewer recalled receiving information about how it would proceed, 29%, uh, or next steps, again, 29%. Smaller still for a copy of the terms of reference, etc. That's right. So again, a multiple choice question, and um, yes, the the three uh, there, the information about being processed, about how it would be processed, the next steps, and the terms of reference were very similarly uh, responded to. Thank you. Turning to Figure Thirty Five, please. This addresses the overall perceptions of applying to the scheme. And we see they're just under half, 47% uh, found it hard to understand the scheme. And in terms of completing the paperwork, there was 57% uh, net hard response. Uh, much smaller numbers in terms of those respondents who found understanding the scheme or completing the paperwork to be uh, very easy or quite easy. Uh, Certainly very easy, sorry. That's right, yes. Um, in both of these, we see a, a fairly significant percentage in the middle. Yes, that's correct. Uh, moving on to the value of the claims, at page 49 of your report, uh, you say that 39% valued their own claim at less than £20,000. 14% valued their claim between £20,000 and £60,000. Um, so adding those two together, uh, is it right to say that a majority valued their claim at less than £60,000 or less? Yes, that's right. Uh, and only 16% valued their claim at more than £100,000. That's right. Um, the next figure you're going to have to help me a great deal with, that's figure 36. Can you, can you assist us with some broad themes from this? Yeah, yeah so this one, uh, we were interested in the, the value of, the, of their own claim, as you've, just been, as you've just mentioned, and how that contrasted with the value from the Post Office Limited uh, in response to that uh, claim. And so we charted one uh, against the other. What so, do we see at the top and what do we see yeah, down so the side? The, the columns are the, the claimant value, so the, the value that the claimant uh, has placed on it, and the, uh, the rows are the value that the post office has placed upon it. So in 73% of cases where the claimant value was uh, less than £20,000, that was in complete agreement with the post office uh, valuation. So that's the highest uh, percentage. Uh, and that's in bold there in the top left. That's in bold side. in the top left-hand corner. And if you kind of go in a diagonal uh, uh, downwards from that top left-hand corner to the bottom right-hand corner, then you can see where the claim uh, values matched. Um, so the, th the 37, the 12, the 9, and then the 17. So the, 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 the matching of claimant and post office value uh, the percentage where they matched fell, but then it rose again for the very highest um, uh, claim levels. In the bottom right-hand corner, there's a, a summation of, of that. So uh, for those who had a claim of uh, £100,000 or less, 71% uh, of those were matched by the, the post office valuation. Um, but for those who had um, a claim of uh, more than 100000 is 26% of those had a, uh, a match with what the post office believed uh, the valuation would be. So is it right to say that at the lowest end, so the less than 20,000, um, it was more likely that applicants would receive the same valuation from the post office up to a certain point, at which point the figures change again? That's right, yes. Uh, and that point is, is what, £100,000? Yes. So in between the £20,000 and the £100,000, it was perhaps, to some extent, less likely that the post office would agree with your valuation that, when compared right. to yeah. less than uh, or more than. 
Yes, that's right. Although, I mean, those who had the valuation, their own valuation of 200,000 or, or more, although there was a higher match than the middle uh, valuations, it still was only 17%. Thank you. Could we Sorry, I, I want to make sure I understand what this is saying. If we just take the 20,000, less than 20,000, first of all, all right? So am I right in thinking that if the postmaster sought 15,000 pounds, in 73% of cases, the post office also said 15,000 pounds? That's correct. But it doesn't mean that in 27 cases, 27% of cases, the post office said nothing, it might, they may have said eleven or twelve thousand pounds. That, that, that's what we're talking about, is it? Uh, no, it, in terms of the that there are brackets there. So yeah. In some cases, the post office valuation was higher uh, than. So it could be higher as well, right? Fine. And so, does that apply throughout? So that when we take a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand, um, say, again, in twelve percent of cases, if. The sub postmaster said 150,000. The post office agreed. Yeah. And the drips have come back, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, you don't understand that, but I occasionally get dripped on. Oh. <laughs> um, so is that right? That in 12% uh, of cases, they would say agree at 150,000? Um, I, I'm just taking 150 as an arbitrary figure now. If the postmaster said 150, yes. So if if, if the if the claimant value was there in that in that bracket between 100 yeah. and 200, then there was a matching valuation of also sure. between two, in nine percent of cases. But you can see above the nine percent there, it was then became more common for the post office valuation to be lower than the claimant sure. valuation. Yeah. We have, you're 21% above that. We have 25% above that. Um, OK. M moving, please, to figure 37. The survey then looked at elements of uh, the claim that were included. 78%, so a very high proportion, included a claim for compensation for a horizon discrepancy. Uh, and then it moves quite considerably down as you go down. Um, the second most significant was distress and inconvenience. Uh, third is loss of earnings. Uh, and then much smaller figures for those other matters, such as personal injury. Yes, again, a multiple choice um, question. Thank you. So they could take all, all of those if they wanted to? Yes, they could have done. Moving now to legal advice, can we please look at figure 38? And we see there at the question at the bottom, at any point during the scheme, did Post Office Limited? And then we have the answers there. Um, only 33% had been informed, say, reported having been informed of their right to obtain legal advice. Is that correct? Uh, that's right, yes. And an even lower percentage, only 10%, reported having been provided with information about how they could contact a legal representative. That's right. Page 52 of your report, the final paragraph, it's noted that only 12% actually received legal advice during the application process. Yes, that's right. And that's the application process, and, and we'll look in terms of legal advice uh, in respect of the actual offer. Yes, the, the, the questionnaire asked at a number of different points in this, in this journey, if you like, about whether legal advice was obtained at different points. Thank you. Um, and you were asked by um, a core participant a, a follow-up question, and if you could, uh, we don't need to turn it up, but if you could look at your addendum report on page three of that report. It's the first question on page three, or first two questions on page three. Uh, can you assist us with that, please? Uh, yes, yeah, so we, we were asked whether it was possible to differentiate the outcomes uh, for those who were legally represented uh, and unrepresented. Um, now, we, we have noted that not that many were uh, said that they were legally represented, which does uh, limit the analysis um, somewhat. Um, in a specific question, we were asked if the data uh, was sufficient to identify 
any differentiation in the value of the claim that was pursued uh, based upon whether there was legal advice uh, or not. So uh, we responded by, by writing that those who did not seek legal advice at the application stage were more likely to value their claim at less than 20,000. Um, that's 45% of whom versus 9% who, who did not. Um, but there was not a significant difference for those um, between 20,000 and 200,000. Um, about one in five of those who sought legal advice uh, valued their claim at uh, 200,000 pounds or more, um, and that was compared to 10% of those who did not seek legal advice. Um, but it's worth noting that those seeking legal advice were more likely to say they didn't know or couldn't remember the value of their claim, and they were more likely to select, uh, prefer not to say to that question. Thank you. Um, could we turn, please, to figure 39, and this addresses the sufficiency of legal support uh, for legal advice during the application process. Ah, oh, that one doesn't have a value in there. It, could we please bring up on screen EXPG 607? page 53. Thank you, that's figure 39. Uh, we see there a lot of red, 63% reported as uh, not having received financial support during the application process, is that correct? Yes, that's right, so 11% in this chart um, said that they received some financial support that, that they considered to be sufficient and 7% uh, that they had some financial support but it was not considered to be sufficient by them. Thank you. And at page, on, on the same page, um, you've addressed some open-ended answers. Are you able to briefly summarise those? Yes, so we were asked about um, uh, receiving um, support, receiving um, both financial support and legal support and why it was not why they had not done that um, the most commonly mentioned responses were uh, a belief in um, uh, financial constraints so they didn't believe they could afford um, to do so a lack of awareness um, around that um, and some uh, trust in the system some mentioned that they felt they didn't have sufficient evidence or documentation to therefore um, engage uh, legal support as well. Thank you. If we turn back to EXPG 608 and turn to figure 40. Um, if we look at the bottom there, it says, how satisfied or dissatisfied were you with the legal advice you received? Uh, and overall, high levels of net satisfaction with the legal advice received, 65% uh, against a net dissatisfaction of 7%. Yes, that's right. But again, remembering not a huge number of, of respondents actually received any legal advice. Um, so that is based on 176 uh, replies. If we turn over the page, please, to figure 41, that addresses financial support for legal advice when an offer was received. Um, so this only applied to those who had received an offer. Yes, so it's a very small group um, of 65 responses. And we see that, ah, oh, this one doesn't have a value either. Let, let's work off the actual report. So let's turn to EXPG 607. And figure 41, that's page 55. So we see there 55% say yes, they received financial support for legal advice, 32% um, considered it to be sufficient, 23% said it wasn't sufficient. That's right, yes, and 29% uh, reported no financial support at that point. So compared to the earlier figures that we saw in terms of those receiving financial support for legal advice during the application process, um, there's a much higher proportion who responded that they had received financial support. Uh, yes. Um, 
at page 55, again, you have some open-ended responses. Can you very briefly summarize those? Yeah, so this is at a different um, stage in the, in the process. Uh, but yes, the main reasons for not uh, doing so at this point in the process, um, the, the key themes uh, around uh, cost again, but also um, that having got to that point, it was felt to be quite close to the end and that many just wanted it to, to end at that stage and not to, to carry on. Thank you. Could we turn now to figure 42, so that's page 57. The survey then goes on to look at various uh, payments and types of payments. You address on that page interim payments. Those are payments that were introduced after August 2022 uh, in respect of 80% uh, of a claim. Uh, and can you assist us with, um, perhaps if, if you could turn to the top of page 57, we don't need to scroll up, but can you just assist us with um, the statistics there? Yes, so um, th this, this needs to, uh, the introduction to, um, to assist with the charts. So the vast majority, it's 82% of those surveyed, reported that they had not made an application for an interim payment. Um, uh, and there were, there were many that were not aware that such an application was, uh, was available um, for them. We uh, had 14% um, of those surveyed had uh, applied for the interim payment. And 34% weren't aware that such uh, an application was available, is that correct? That's right, yes. We also had a question about intention, um, which we'll come on to. Uh, and that's this this, these yeah. charts that are shown now. Can you assist us with what these show, please? Yes, yeah, so this is um, intention to, um, to make uh, an application, and the first one being for the fixed sum uh, payment, uh, and the second one being the, the interim payment as part of uh, the claim um, and the majority in, in both cases um, don't have um, an intention to do so. And slightly um, slightly more uh, red on, on the interim payments than the fixed sum payments. Yes, that's right. Yes. 39 compared to 23. Um, and again, we don't need to turn it up onto screen, but if you could look at your addendum report, please. There was a follow-up question that related to this issue uh, asked by a core participant, um, and, and that's the further question. Yes, yeah, so th this question is, is whether the, the data uh, is sufficient to identify whether those in receipt of legal advice were more or less likely to have made an application for an interim payment. Uh, we found there was no differences in the proportion saying that they had, had done so based on the legal advice. Um, uh, we point out further, those who sought legal advice at this stage were more likely than those who did not to, um, to say that they attended to, um, that they intended to uh, apply. So what I've just talked about was whether they had applied in the past. That was the same. But the intention was different based on um, whether there was legal advice or not. So the intention differed uh, by, uh, in the case of the fixed sum payments, the intention differed by 51%. Uh, of those with legal advice versus 37%. Um, and uh, in terms of the interim payment, it was 45% compared to 18%. Um, so do we summarize that, that if uh, those who had uh, sought legal advice were more likely to intend to apply for a fixed sum payment or an interim payment uh, than those who hadn't sought legal advice? That's correct, yes. Figure 43 then, please, over the page, to page 58. It looks at satisfaction with those two options. Um, quite small numbers being analyzed there because those were only based on those who intended to make the application, is that correct? Or had already done so, in fact. Uh, yes, that's right. Yeah. And can you assist us with those figures there? Uh, yes, so for the um, interim payment process, the uh, level of satisfaction being 14% uh, compared to those who were 48% uh, who were dissatisfied. Uh, the fixed sum payment option, the level of satisfaction there was uh, slightly higher, uh, more satisfied than dissatisfied. Um, there was some evidence as well of differences in terms of the more recent claimants um, 
where the satisfaction levels were likely to be um, higher than those who had claimed uh, in the past. Uh, higher for both or higher for just one of them? Uh, just, pick, just picking out the fixed sum payment option. Thank you. So that fixed sum payment option, uh, there is a greater number uh, percentage in the purple uh, than interim payment and smaller in the red. Yes. Uh, moving on to case assessors, that's figure 44 over the page, please. Uh, case assessors provide an initial valuation. And if we look at that figure, figure 44, it assesses the proportion who are aware of the role and more people were not aware of the role of case assessor than were aware, is that correct? Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, we found that 78% had not had, uh, reported not having uh, received contact from a case assessor uh, and 10% had received some contact uh, in the past and then that, that chart moves on to awareness of what the role uh, of the case assessor was. If we look at figure 45 over the page, that addresses satisfaction with the service received from a case assessor. Uh, that assesses quite a small number, only 151 respondents, because those were, um, if we scroll down slightly, those who had been contacted by a case assessor. Yes, yeah, so that relates to the 10% who reported having been contacted, and then they were asked some follow-up questions about their level of satisfaction with three aspects of the um, case assessor's service. And if we look there, there was in particular a greater number that were net dissatisfied with the time it took for a case assessor to assess their claim uh, compared to only 17% who were net satisfied. Yes, the time taken was the element of least uh, uh, satisfaction. Uh, moving on to the independent advisory panel, that's the panel that's tasked with assessing and recommending a fair outcome for applicants. Um, could we please look at figure 46? That's over the page. Scroll down slightly. Um, it seems as though there's slightly more um, people who are unaware of the independent advisory panel than were aware. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. In comparison, 27% being aware of, of it versus 32% who are unaware. Um, over the page, please, to figure 47. This then addresses the satisfaction with uh, the amount of information provided by the panel and the length of time to consider the claim. Um, this seems relatively similar to the responses to the case assessor satisfaction levels, uh, more red than purple. That's right, and, and this is based on um, only those who uh, knew about the involvement of the independent appeals. And the one that stands out slightly more is the bottom one, regarding the information provided um, to the individual about the panel process uh, with a net dissatisfaction of 52% uh, set against a net satisfaction of 20%. That's right. We now turn to the offer from the historic shortfall scheme. And could we please turn over to figure 48? There is a lot of information in your report at the top of page 63 that isn't addressed by that particular figure. Um, can you assist us with those statistics, please? Yes, this was context, uh, contextual questions. So uh, about half of those um, surveyed had been informed of the outcome um, that they had received, uh, but around about half hadn't. So rough, rough split between those who knew and those who didn't yet know uh, about it. Um, and there is some information there about um, the likelihood of uh, people at, uh, who applied at different points in time about whether they had, whether they had reached the end, which, is, um, which I think uh, would just reflect what you would logically um, expect. So the lowest number, 19%, um, had applied post-October 2022? That's right, yes. They had not yet reached the end of the process. And I think you also saw some differences in age, is that correct? Uh, yes, so um, th those, those older uh, claimants were uh, less likely to have applied um, recently. Uh, they were obviously then, therefore, more likely to have had an outcome by this point um, than uh, younger claimants who had not yet reached the end of the process. So a higher percentage reported reaching an outcome who were aged 60 and above? 
Yes, that's right. Could we, if we look at figure 48, that addresses the satisfaction with the amount of information provided. Um, can you assist us with that, please? Yes, yeah, so th this chart shows only those who had had an outcome and they were asked about uh, three elements of, of the outcome that had been received, so the time that, that it had taken, the amount uh, and the amount of information provided about uh, how the outcome was, um, was determined. And there's a lot of red there, in particular in this particular chart, uh, a large number in the very dissatisfied category, is that correct? Yes, so the, 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 the one with the highest um, degree of very sat dissatisfied was the offer amount, and then relatively similar in terms of the time that it was taken to get to an outcome and the amount of information provided about how the outcome was determined. Thank you. We don't need to turn to it, but if you could look um, at page 64, you provide some further information, you drill down a little bit further into those figures. Um, can you assist us with some themes there? Yeah, so the, uh, the, the subgroup analysis of, of these uh, elements of the, of the outcome, uh, they showed some particular differences in terms of ethnicity. Um, so uh, those from an ethnic minority background were more likely um, to say that they were dissatisfied with the offer amount. That is a comparison between 77% and 53%. And there was um, a suggestion of higher levels of dissatisfaction among uh, younger age groups compared to older um, sub-postmasters, uh, 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 sorry, claimants. Um, there was also uh, higher levels of dissatisfaction among ethnic minority applicants in terms of the time it took and the amount of information that was provided, some quite large differences there. For example, in the time it took to reach an outcome, 71% of ethnic minority applicants were dissatisfied compared to 46% of white uh, respondents. And I think you also say 92% of those uh, with an offer accepted it either in full or in part? Uh, yes, that's right. And um, uh, only 8% said that they rejected the offer. And those aged 60 plus were more likely to have accepted, uh, as yeah. were those in Scotland when compared to England? Yes, that's right, yeah. Um, could we please turn to... EX, uh, in fact, we don't need to bring it up on screen, but if you could look at your addendum report on page three, there's a final question at the bottom of that page that was posed by um, a core participant. Can you assist us with that, please? Yeah, so this again asked us to look at um, those who had legal advice and those who didn't. Uh, was there any difference in the proportion of um, those who were dissatisfied with the outcome based on whether they had legal advice or not. So those who received legal advice at any stage of the process, uh, in order to create this, we added them up because uh, respondents were asked at different stages whether they had received legal advice. So we added them all together to create a group of people who had received legal advice at any, whatever stage it was. Uh, those who had received uh, legal advice were more likely than those who did not to be dissatisfied um, so they were more likely to be dissatisfied with the offer amount, 77% versus 56%. They were more likely to be dissatisfied with the time it took, 71% um, uh, versus 50%. But again, as we pointed out earlier, this is a case of um, uh, possibly, you know, this is a correlation between those factors. We can't say that one was caused by the other necessarily. Thank you. If we could please turn back to EXPG 607, page 65, and we have figure 49. Uh, it looks at the reasons why applicants accepted the offer in part or in full. Uh, and what do we see there? So again, a, a multiple choice um, uh, question and um, we're looking at uh, only those people who had accepted the offer in part or in full um, and we see there that the the most common reason that they gave was that they wanted the process to finish uh, over 51 percent um, saying that there were some interesting differences on the basis of age group uh, with with this uh, so those who had said that their financial circumstances um, uh, led them to want the uh, process to finish. Uh, it was more likely um, 
you know, that, that, um, that, uh, that, that those in a younger age group um, said that it was more likely that they wanted uh, the uh, process to end because of financial circumstances. So that was 48% versus 29. Um, uh, those who were satisfied with the offer, um, as we just heard on the previous question, um, the uh, older uh, age groups were more likely to be satisfied with the offer than uh, younger uh, age groups. Uh, and overall, in terms of satisfaction, though, it's only 15% who reported being satisfied with the offer. That's right. Yes. Thank you. Um, over the page, we don't need to turn to it, but if you could please have a look at page 66, you address briefly their dispute resolution. I think it only applies to very small numbers. Yes, only a very small number of, of people went down that path. So we, in the report, we uh, we detail that there were only 30 um, observations of those who were surveyed in dispute resolution. Uh, 25 of them said that their claim did not go to the small claims court or arbitration. Uh, more were dissatisfied than satisfied with the process at 16 versus 4. Thank you. And very finally, um, there is a chart, figure 50, over the page with overall perceptions of the historic shortfall scheme. Um, overall dissatisfied was 49% versus 12 who were satisfied. And can you assist us with what we see here? Uh, yes, yeah, so we have um, uh, six uh, elements of the overall process. Um, and asked about those as a, as a group. One of those patterns that keeps coming up in this data uh, is that difference between younger and older age groups. So those who are in a younger age group uh, were the most likely group to be dissatisfied across these elements. Uh, old, those older claimants were um, uh, less likely to be dissatisfied. Satisfaction levels were higher among those who have received compensation, which I, I suspect is a logical conclusion. Um, so their overall satisfaction was 19% uh, compared to 5% of those who had not um, yet received a, a, an outcome. But still 19% being satisfied isn't especially high, of course. Um, and then, yeah, we have six elements of, um, of the uh, process as a whole the amount of compensation, the time that it took, having enough information, being easy to understand, being fully informed um, throughout the process. And again, we have considerable amounts of red there, not very much purple. Uh, that's right, yes, and some, again, uh, interesting differences in terms of ethnicity that are pointed out in the report. So the one to uh, draw attention to perhaps around the scheme being easy to understand and navigate. We had 46% of white respondents being dissatisfied uh, with that, compared to 57% of those from an ethnic minority background. Thank you very much. And then finally, you, over the page, um, and over the page again, you've set out some open-ended answers. Um, can you assist us with any trends that you saw there? Yes, yeah, so again, uh, similarly to survey one, we wanted to provide uh, everyone with an opportunity to say anything else they wanted to report um, uh, back. Uh, we did have a couple of different boxes, though. We, we, we uh, tried to have a box which was encouraging um, if there was anything constructive or positive that they had to say about the scheme um, to prompt around that. Um, that was uh, interesting. It was revealing because uh, some then uh, wrote that they um, appreciated the scheme, largely because it's acknowledged uh, that the post office uh, was at fault, um, that the scheme was bringing issues to light, um, and the scheme was, of course, uh, a, a pathway to receiving some compensation. Um, so there were some uh, positive elements there. Some people um, found the, the scheme process uh, easier to navigate than others and they wrote about their experiences um, there, and there was that connection I mentioned earlier with more recent applicants finding it um, slightly easier. Um, but then uh, later boxes, uh, the, the, the more negativity came through about the scheme, um, so later opportunities to make um, some comments. The thematic analysis of that, 
Um, there was generally uh, felt to be a, a lack of clarity, um, the time taken, uh, and inadequacy of the compensation amounts were, were uh, themes that came through. So themes of speed and efficiency, um, communication, transparency, uh, fairness in compensation. And again, similarly to survey number one, we've provided examples of um, uh, comments that were made that fit those, those themes. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Ellison, I, I don't have any questions. Um, I'll just check if the chair has any questions. No, thank you, no. Thank you very much. Mr. Ellison, I'm very grateful for all the work you've done, and I'm also grateful that you've come here today to give oral evidence. Thank you. So if we take our second morning break yes. now, and um, if we come back, it's 10 past 12. Right. Thank you. Yes, it's okay. So this morning, uh, this afternoon even, and possibly into tomorrow morning, we're going to hear from Mr. Ismail. Yeah. I swear by Allah. I swear by Allah. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence that I shall give shall be the truth, shall be the, truth, the, whole truth the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Give your full name, please. Safraz Gulam Ismail. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ismail, you should have in front of you a witness statement dated the 4th of September of this year. Is that correct? That's correct. Can I ask you, please, to turn to the final substantive page? Which is page 144. Uh, can you confirm that that is your signature? Yes. Uh, and can you confirm that that statement is true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Uh, by way of background, you are a current sub-postmaster, is that right? That's correct. Um, your first branch was in Preston in January 2010? Yes, that's correct. Um, I think you've said in your witness statement that you worked on uh, the counters using Horizon for about six days a week originally? Yes. Your business has grown and you currently oversee seven branches and a banking hub. Yes, that's correct. I think you still work on the counter uh, in branches on occasion? Yes. And you're also a director of a number of different companies covering not just the post office but also property and retail businesses, is that right? Yes. Relevant for today's purpose, you were appointed a non-executive director of Post Office Limited on the 3rd of June 2021, is that right? That's correct. And sometimes referred to as a sub-postmaster non-executive director or SPM NED. Correct. Um, there are two sub-postmaster non-executive directors. Uh, the other is Elliot Jacobs, who we're going to be hearing from tomorrow. Correct. Yeah. Um, one issue that we have to deal with is that you are subject to a current investigation by the post office, uh, which is not related to horizon or discrepancies. Is that right? Correct. Uh, and we won't go into detail, uh, but that means that for the time being, you've stepped back from the board uh, whilst an investigation is taking place. Correct. Thank you. Now, I'm going to start with your appointment as a sub-postmaster non-executive director. Uh, you describe in your witness statement standing for election, uh, and I would just like you to take us briefly through that process. Um, to start with, can any sub-postmaster stand for election? Yes, so <clears throat> initially a criteria was set by the post office and applications were invited. And once postmasters who met the criteria submitted their applications, the post office then narrowed down 
who, 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 who fit the bill. Then once that was done, it went to an organization called Green Park, who narrowed it down further. And there was interviews taking place with a panel, an independent panel. Uh, from 12, they whittled down to six. And once it got to the point where there were six, it was producing material for election purposes from your fellow postmasters who would then vote for whom they thought would represent them the best within the organization. So throughout that election process, I gained the most number of votes, and Elliot Jacobs got the second number of votes, and us two were both appointed to the post office board. Thank you. And is it all sub current sub-postmasters who are allowed to vote? Yes. Thank you. And your appointments, were they both on the same date, the 3rd of June? of 2021? Yes. yes. And how long is the term of appointment? It was three years initially, but that has been extended recently due to issues with the existing recruitment of postmaster NEDs. And what are those issues, very briefly? The, the, the time scale wasn't met, unfortunately. So just to give the business some cover with postmasters on the board, the, the business thought it'd be worthwhile extending myself and Mr. Jacobs. Thank you. How many days a month do you spend on your non-executive director work? On average, 10 days a month. And the advertisement the, initially was for two days a month. It's very intense. Now, in your view, is that extra time commitment as a result of what's currently going on in the post office in terms of the inquiry and in terms of redress? or? Is it, in your view, more time consuming than two days in, in any event? I, I, from my observations being on the board, I feel it's probably a bit of both. This organisation is so bureaucrat bureaucratic to get anything done just takes a very long time. So that's part of the problem, but also with how much going on. There's so many fires at the moment within this organisation that need putting out. And in order to deal with that, obviously, time's needed, hence why it does take a lot longer. Thank you. I'm going to ask you some introductory questions about the board, but we're going to drill down into a lot more detail in, in due course. Um, in general, do you consider that the role of postmaster non-executive director was something that was welcomed by the board when you joined? The board that the NEDs on the board were welcoming and were hospitable however the wider executive made it difficult and within my witness statement I've, I've clearly evi provided evidence of situations when we didn't feel as welcomed by the wider executive and was that specific individuals or, or more broadly the executive? M more broadly, uh, from, from what I observed, there were times, so for example, in February 24, when I was told by an individual on the wider executive that we don't want to particularly deal with you and Mr Jacobs because we feel really uncomfortable with what's been happening uh, you've been going to the press. That was difficult not to hear, but that, 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 those were the conversations that were happening. What was also disappointing was when I had conversations through from January, throughout January 23 up to March 23 with the former chief people officer, Jane Davies, and she categorically said to me how the CEO was not happy with the postmasters being on the board because we were too awkward, too challenging, and that he wanted that to be reversed. And that so, was Mr. Reid? Yeah, Mr. Reid. Um, at paragraph 49 of your witness statement, uh, you talk about the balance of executives to non-executives on the board, and you've highlighted that there are two executive members uh, and eight non-executive directors. Um, what, in your view, is the overall balance of the board? Can, can I have that on the screen, sorry? Absolutely. So if we could bring up on screen WITN 
11170100. It's page 18. It's in no way a memory test about your witness statement. Um, the point being made there is that there are two executive members uh, and there are eight directors being non-executive directors. Um, can you assist us with your view as to the balance between those two? I feel it's an imbalance. And the reason I say that is, firstly, the eight non-executive directors they are not operationally savvy. They're not necessarily aware of what is happening in the business on a day-to-day -day basis. The, the headwinds postmasters are facing, they're not necessarily understanding postmaster economics. And from my observations whilst being on the board, the two executive members who would produce information that would be disseminated to the board was from the wider executive's lens so on a number of occasions when we would receive reports, myself and Mr. Jacobs would provide criticism uh, and maybe that's why we were thought to be awkward. Uh, we would give the document uh, a, a, a sanity check in terms of what's actually going on on the front line. So for me, the imbalance is quite clear and unfortunately decisions are made through selected information that's provided to the board by the, by the executive that are on the board. Thank you. Uh, one of the roles for it that you've given an example of is the chief people officer and you've suggested that it might be helpful to have the chief people officer on the, on the wider board. Uh, can you assist us with why that might be? Yes, I, I feel as an organisation culturally We've got a long way to go. I, I heard Paula Venels in her testimony say how she started cultural change or she tried in 2012. I, I don't feel we've even gone off the ground, got off the ground. And for me, if we want to own that and fix that, surely the chief people officer should be a permanent fixture on the board. That's my view. Another issue that you've highlighted, and we, we don't need to turn it up, is um, you say that the board has been author, um, re is required to authorise any spend over £5 million, and that, in your view, the board is seen as a cash machine. Can you expand upon that briefly? Yes. So any time any authorisation for any specific spend over £5 million is required, that comes to the board. And again, the board makes a decision based on information provided by the wider executive. Now, sometimes the decisions are correct and sometimes they are incorrect, but the business sees the board in a way to get their authorizations done. Anything below five million, there's very limited visibility for the board. And at paragraph 56, again, we don't really need to turn it up. You, you've described the board as too deferential to the executive. Um, and I think you've given an example in respect of recruitment uh, and the, um, I think you've said that the executive has overrided a decision of the board or something along those lines. Can you assist us with uh, what you uh, have explained there? Yes, so there's been occasions when board members have been invited to conduct interviews for very senior roles, highly paid senior roles within the organization and the board members who are part of the panel, this is their skill set. They know what they are looking for. And when the interviews have been conducted, the board members made it very, very clear that it should be candidate A out of A, B, C, D, for example. However, the wider executive has then totally ignored that advice, providing no reasoning whatsoever and then gone and recruited candidate B. Is that in, in respect of one particular role, several roles? A few roles, while, that's my observation while I have been there. And do any stand out in particular? Mm. 
that was on the chief retail officer. That, that one stands out in particular. There was on the male side, on, on that side. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another issue in respect of the board that you've raised is in respect of information sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's paragraph 84. You raise a concern that the board isn't given uh, appropriate levels of information. If we start with the board as a whole, rather than just the sub-postmaster non-executive directors, um, what are your concerns about the level of information that the board as a whole are provided with? So we receive some board packs with too much information, too much noise. We then receive other board packs or other bits of information where it's not the right information, unfortunately, to make key decisions, and it's resulted in some wrong decisions, unfortunately. And again, that's based on what the executive has provided. So to give you an example, we've got uh, information in September 21 on a certain project. I'm not sure if I can mention the project name, but there was information provided to the board where this subservience circle to lawyers that exists within this organization. And from my time on the board, this was the first time that was broken. And that was because of myself and Mr. Jacobs resisting. And that resistance in turn resulted in the business saving five million pounds. And that was the first time I was totally against the legal advice. And Tim Parker at the time, the chair, supported what we were saying. Um, that was one example. Are, are there particular parts within the business that you feel are not providing the board with sufficient information? Yes, I've, I feel procurement is particularly poor. Legal is extremely poor. On a, from a commercial perspective, it depends who's dealing with which area from a commercial side because this business got, has got so many different avenues to it. It varies from who, who, who you're getting and the individual that's dealing with the issue at that time and their capabilities. That's the board as a whole. Mm -hmm. Now looking at just the sub-postmaster non-executive directors, is there a difference in the level of information that you are provided with? 100%. And can you assist us with, with some examples of that? Yes. So up until recently, we were not provided access to any of the other committee documents that we were not on. So for myself, I was on the nominations committee. I only had access to nominations committee's papers and the board papers. Um, for Elliot, he was on ARC. So he had... Um, for, for audit and risk committee and, and for the board and for the investment committee. There was, there was times when, again, I, when I spoke to the previous chair, Henry, and to Jane Davies, they particularly mentioned how the wider executive ensured myself and Mr. Jacobs were blocked out of meetings that involved talking about bonuses and salaries. We were, we, were, we were actively excluded from their meetings. And was a reason ever given to you for that? No. And who are you aware, um, or who do you believe excluded you from those meetings? The, the wider executive. And anybody in particular? There was... Henry mentioned, Nick, Nick Reed specifically mentioned to him, he doesn't want us involved in, in any kind of information regarding salaries and bonuses. On a separate topic, I think you've also mentioned in your evidence being provided with information such as exit interviews. Can you briefly tell us about that issue? So for me, as part of my non-executive director role, and to keep on top of governance and understanding how this organization can be better and has got to be better. I wanted to be cited on exit interviews from previous NEDs to hopefully not make the same mistakes, uh, be a proactive 
learner, and unfortunately the business didn't provide me any access to that. And were any reasons given to you for that? No. Today we're going to be spending quite a lot of time on three particular topics. The first is known as the Past Roles Project, the second is known as Project Phoenix, and the third is known as Project Pineapple. I'm going to start with Project Phoenix and the Past Roles Project. Could we please start by looking at poll 00448308, please? This is the terms of reference for what is known as the Past Roles Project. I'm going to read to you briefly from this document. It says, context, after the inquiry compensation hearing in December 2022, it became apparent that the post office had recruited into its remediation unit team, the RU team, employees who had previously worked for the post office in the auditing, investigation, suspension or termination of postmasters connected to historic Horizon shortfall cases. Just pausing there, do you know why it was only after the inquiry's compensation hearing uh, that that link seems to have been drawn between the two? No. Um, it says this risks a risk undermining the integrity of or the public or postmaster confidence in the work being done by the remediation unit. Uh, it also puts employees at risk. Uh, the remediation unit took a conflicts paper to the group executive on the 7th of July 2023 and a further paper, a past roles paper, recommending work to identify uh, those employees within that unit who are um, potentially problematic historic roles uh, with a view to redeploying them and extending this thinking in the wider business. So the past roles project, just to understand it correctly, it is about identifying people from the remediation unit who are working on issues such as compensation and redress, uh, appeals against conviction, uh, assisting the inquiry. Uh, and if they worked in a role that um, I think it says there um, was problematic, potentially problematic historical role, uh, they would be redeployed within the business. Is, is that right? Yes. Um, the aim there, the aim of the project is to first review the past roles conducted by colleagues currently employed within the remediation unit and the inquiry teams to identify any that could be, for want of a better word, potentially problematic. Uh, second, identify where else in the business other than the remediation unit and inquiry such roles might also pose a similar risk. Uh, third, identify the employees who have uh, who have these potentially problematic backgrounds and who are working in roles in uh, which that creates an identified risk. Uh, fourth, mitigate the risks, including by internal and external comms, uh, provided employee with appropriate support, training and education, and exploring redeployment. If we scroll down, please, it sets out there the problematic past roles roles that were involved in the auditing, investigation, suspension or termination of postmasters and post office employees. Uh, so there were some individuals who held roles in the um, auditing, investigating and suspending uh, or terminating uh, postmasters who were at that point in time employed uh, within the remediation team. Is that right? Yes. And if we scroll down please over the page um, the risks that could emerge, it says, for example, criticism of employees, say on social media, uh, two, undermining the integrity of the work being performed, uh, three, undermining postmaster uh, of the public confidence uh, in the work being performed by the post office or the specific team. If that is in, view, in order of priority, do you agree with that prioritization? Uh, that the first risk is criticism of employees, say, on social media? No. Uh, what do you see uh, as the most significant risk of those individuals uh, being employed within the remediation unit? It's morally wrong. Uh, and why do you I, say that? 
the, the number of conversations that postmasters have had with, my, with, with me and Mr. Jacobs, criticising how individuals are still in that, in that unit. It, it's incredible, and some of the examples are probably not, not for this forum, but that, those are the, some of the examples that have been given of things that criminals have done in the past, not necessarily uh, then giving their own compensation out. This is how postmasters are feeling. And for me, I, I don't think the focus was right on this project. And to be, to be clear, from my observations at the time, there was no particular appetite to deal with this issue. The only point when some kind of urgency, it wasn't even urgency, awareness occurred was um, at the March 23 board meeting. So myself and Mr. Jacobs were encouraged by the business to attend the inquiry, and we did. And we saw Brian Trotter, we heard Brian Trotter give evidence. And for myself and Mr. Jacobs, some of the evidence wasn't comfortable. And the following day, I think we had a board meeting. Within, within a, f a week or so, we had a board meeting. And that's when we raised our concerns about Mr. Trotter working in the remediations unit. And we specifically mentioned him because that's why we came to the inquiry. And in that meeting, the general counsel, Ben Folt, said he would look into it. And can you assist us with, are you aware of what role Mr. Trotter had within the remediation unit? No, I wasn't aware specifically with his role at, at the time, once he was rehired. However, prior to that, his role as a contracts manager, yes. And conversations that I've, I have had with individuals in the business probably earlier this year, regarding that specific scenario and on past roles was one of the reasons, and again, I'm not singling out Mr. Trotter here at all, uh, one of the reasons the organization did remove quite a few individuals who were investigations, contracts managers at the time, was because culturally they weren't in the right place. And what this specific sp person said to me in our uh, private meeting was he was deeply disappointed once they were rehired because he thought he'd already dealt with this. Do you know who is responsible for the rehiring? No. no. Uh, can we please turn to poll 00448615? Uh, we're moving forward now to the 17th of January of this year. Um, and, and this is an update. Um, to the group executive, and we see there the title, Past Roles Review. And it says uh, in the first paragraph, uh, the group executive is asked to note uh, the update in respect of the past roles work being undertaken uh, in the remediation unit and similar work being rolled out across the business since being approved by the group executive on the 7th of July, 2023, and clarified on 8th of November 2023 and 20th of December 2023. Uh, so looking at the time scales there, it w was that after the meeting that you've described? Yes, that's correct. And this was pressure that started to be applied by myself and Mr. Jacobs every few months. Um, so from the summer of 2023, uh, increasing as the year went on uh, and into January 2024? Yes. If we look at the bottom of this page, please, it then sets out what we know as Project Phoenix or the difference between the past roles project and Project Phoenix. Um, it says, for the avoidance of doubt, this work is not concerned with dealing with any colleague in respect of whom wrongdoing has been alleged. Uh, this work is about the roles employees may have performed in the past and not about how they may have performed those roles. If there are specific allegations of wrongdoing against a colleague, they should be, and in many cases are being, picked up by the people team elsewhere. Um, was that distinction between the past roles uh, review and what we know as Project Phoenix, was, it, was that clear to you, the difference between the two? No. 
the point at which we got clarity was February, March this year, when a specific, there was an email from Owen Woodley, which was very helpful, and there was a briefing from Karen McEwen, which basically outlined what Pastorals was and what Project Phoenix was. And prior to that, my discussions with other NEDs was, again, they were slightly confused and it was all part and parcel of the information that was provided to the wider executive. Do you have a view as to whether having those two different work streams is, is appropriate or not? Yes, I think for for an investigation purpose, I, I, I feel it's appropriate to split them so we know which is in which category, yes. Um, if we turn to page seven, it sets out the panel there. And on this particular document, um, it refers to Postmaster NED and it has Mark Eldridge's name there. Um, can you assist us with who Mark Eldridge is? So Mark Eldridge is the postmaster director who's recently been appointed, pr probably just about a year ago. Um, so is he a sub-postmaster? He is a sub-postmaster. I'm not sure if he's got the relevant training expertise to be on the panel, but he is a sub-postmaster. But he's not a postmaster non-executive director, or he is? No. I'm not sure why it says postmaster Ned there, no. Uh, and he is there to provide a postmaster's view uh, to the panel to support the decisions made with regards to the past roles of each individual case and how they relate to the role uh, that the colleague currently performs for the post office. Um, are you aware of Elliot Jacobs being uh, lined up for that particular role? Uh, yes, uh, initially a discussion did take place where Elliot was told he would be... On, on the panel, but again, nothing, nothing happened for, for, for that, that to be implemented, unfortunately. And do you know why? No. If we turn, please, to page 11, we then see a comms plan, communications plan, relating to the past roles project. Now, I'd just like to read to you paragraph three uh, under key themes for comms. It says, in carrying out this work, we are acutely aware of the duties we owe to our colleagues and the views of our trade unions. Uh, we also recognize that in the vast majority of cases, employees who have performed such roles in the past will have carried out their duties according to instructions given to them by the business at the time and in the belief that Horizon was robust. Do you have any views on that paragraph? Again, like I've said previously, I think the priority is not right there. Um, the, so we saw before that reference to uh, criticism of employees being yeah. first in the list of risk. Uh, we now see um, the focus here on duties to post office employees. What, what is your concern there? The, de the default position within the post office at this moment in time is protect and I think that's quite clear from both documents. Thank you. Could we please move on then to poll 00448309. And if we could turn to the fire, start on the final page, page four, please. Thank you. So we're now in February 2024, so I think this is the period in which you've said this issue came to the fore. Is that right? We were pushing. We were pushing very hard. Um, and, and it says, I'll just read a, a few paragraphs. Um, it's from Elliot Jacobs, and he says, Dear Board, following on from our meeting almost two weeks ago, where I expressed the strongest of terms, my frustration and utter disbelief, that the matter of Project Phoenix was still nowhere near resolved. I'm concerned uh, we have not received any update on the activity since. Uh, so this is addressing Project Phoenix rather than past roles. Right. 
so just to clarify, this is, this is prior to the clarity being provided. Yeah. So we were under the impression that there was just one project, Project Phoenix, and everyone was in that specific project. Thank you. The, the second paragraph, he says, this is important and urgent. I'm going to read the third paragraph. He says, the claim that this is difficult will simply not cut it. Uh, if it was easy, someone might have done it by now. Uh, but it is uh, the fact that it is hard that we must grasp the nettle and get it done. It is both optically and morally wrong uh, that this has not been dealt with before. This is not a witch hunt, as it has been verbalized previously. Uh, just pausing there, do you know who referred to it as a witch hunt? We can ask Mr. Jacobs tomorrow, so it doesn't matter if you don't. It, it did come to one of the board meetings, and... I, I can't remember, but I do remember the phrase, but I don't remember who used it. Um, this is about making certain the culture and, frankly, the future of the business is not mired in the wrongdoing of bad people who do truly awful things, some of whom, to this very day, believe they did the right thing. Um, was there anybody that you're aware of that Mr Jacobs had in mind? Was this something that was drafted between the two of yes. you? Yes. Yes. And do, did you have anybody in particular in mind in respect of that sentence that I've just read? Some of the investigators that are still within the business. Those who are still investigating or not? Their, their job title's been changed. Uh, but do, you have, do you have anybody in particular in mind? So we were referring to uh, for example, Stephen Bradshaw at the time, because of the evidence that was provided. That was one of the examples. Again, it was not a witch hunt at all. It was a case of individuals. And, 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 and after this email, there was still further evidence from other individuals who, possi who weren't investigators, but it was also very uncomfortable listening. Listening to their evidence yeah. before the inquiry. Yeah. yeah. Um, if we scroll down, he says, we were told uh, the committee was due to meet last week, but I'm not aware of any outcome from that meeting. I would be grateful uh, of an update on the meeting and the decisions that came from it. Uh, if we scroll, please, up onto page two, you have the response from Owen Woodley, and I think this is the response that you were referring to before. We scroll down, thank you. He says, here is an update from the business, Elliot and board. As a reminder, we have two separate programs of activity underway, which Karen is overseeing for us. One is Project Phoenix and the other is Past Roles. These programs are doing separate activities overseen by separate panels to determine appropriate action. The panels are not decision-making for her on individual employment cases. Any actions required on individuals on the back of the panel recommendation are then managed separately as part of a relevant employment process. Project Phoenix is a review of all historical investigations where allegations have been made by postmasters of wrongdoing on the part of post office and or post office employees, both current and past, as part of the public inquiry human impact hearings. Just pausing there, do you know why the investigation into uh, wrongdoing by members of the investigations team did not begin until the public inquiry's human impact hearings. Because there was no ur urgency within the business to deal with this. Unfortunately, it's been so some of the issues the organisation's been dealing with have been inquiry-led, uh, and, and, and that's, that, that's the reality. When it came to that, the email prior to this that Mr Jacobs sent, one of the frustrations we had was we, we were, we were non-executive directors, yes, but we were also postmasters. And I've attended the inquiry a lot and seeing people like Joe Hamilton, Seema Misra, and seeing how they were treated. And seeing what they went through, how, how are postmasters treated the way they are by this organisation? 
and why are employees getting a better deal? That's what it felt like. And again, to emphasize, this was not a witch hunt. This was just parity. You, the, 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 the postmasters were not given enough time, were not given a chance to defend themselves. They are suspended immediately if there's any discrepancies within their branches. But yet, n nobody seems to be suspended when even investigations are still ongoing when it came to Phoenix or pastorals. So it was very frustrating. Um, the email continues, Chris represents SEG on the Phoenix panel, and I'm sure he would confirm that he and the panel fully grasp the importance of what they are dealing with. Uh, past roles is a review of any current employee who may previously have undertaken a role in the past between 1999 and 2017 related to uh, the subject of the public inquiry. Uh, this is to ensure that they create no conflict and pose no risk uh, to either the integrity and independence of work being done now or to postmaster slash public confidence in that work. If we scroll up, please, to page one, we have at the bottom a response from Karen McEwen, the group chief people officer. Um, she says, we have Nick Marriott, uh, and she gives some further names, all supporting uh, Chris on Phoenix and Sarah Gray's team, past roles. They're three of our most capable members of the people team uh, with significant ER experience. Uh, this is our highest priority uh, and is, as you point out, very complex and time consuming. Uh, in your view, uh, was it the highest priority? From my observations, we were being told that it's it's, it's a priority, it's that, but, but it didn't feel like it was. And I, I remember Mr. Jacobs raising that point about Chris Brocklesby being on this panel. He was brought in to look after NBIT. And Mr. Jacobs said, well, why, why are we not utilizing his expertise where it needs to be. Surely he's wasted on, on this panel, but it, it, was one, it was a scenario where the business said, we'll, we'll, we'll look into it. And just to provide a little bit more context to, to this email regarding Sarah Gray's team, Sarah Gray is the interim general counsel at this moment in time. They have had this project since we saw on the previous document, December 22. They weren't fully aware from my understanding and my observations until myself and Mr. Jacobs came to the inquiry in March 23. And I just don't feel the board have got confidence in that legal team. And when it came to April 24, our legal team then went to get legal advice. And what they found out and discovered was the approach they were taking for the last couple of years was actually wrong. So this was really disappointing and really frustrating for the board. As you've said, our understanding was this is a high priority. How can you say it's the highest or a very high priority, but not have the correct plan in place to be fair to the employees and a proper strategy to deal with the issue? Um, and you referred the it's the first reference that's been made um, in phase seven to NBIT. Can you briefly say, uh, tell us what NBIT is? That's the new branch IT system. Um, so Mr. Brocklesby, who was responsible for that new system, was also spending his time um, on the past roles project. Is that right? Yeah, which just seemed very bizarre to myself and Mr. Jacobs. If we scroll up, we have the response from Mr. Jacobs. We'll be hearing from him tomorrow, but um, can you assist us with whether uh, your, your views on what he said here? He says, in case uh, it would seem that I'm implying due process and rigor should not be applied for the avoidance of doubt, I'm not saying that. I do not uh, deny the importance of that. We know this organization has failed horrifically in doing that before. It does, however, seem odd that not a single one is suspended whilst this is ongoing. Why is that? Uh, we seem to suspend people on a regular basis when investigations are ongoing. Uh, why not on this matter? Uh, and is redeploying really the only solution? How does that fix the culture challenge uh, we have here? 
I think further board discussion and ongoing update on this is vital. Were those views that you shared? Correct. Could we please turn to poll 00448649, please? We're now in April um, 2024, and this is a meeting uh, of the board. We have Ben Tidswell there as the senior independent director, but also the nominated chair of that meeting. I mean, is that because there, there wasn't at that point a chair? Correct. Henry Staunton was, was sacked towards the end of January, so Ben took over as chair until we found a new chair. Uh, and we have you there listed as non-executive director. Uh, we have Mr. Reid in attendance as the group chief executive officer. And we have also a possibly relevant name for the material that we'll be looking at, uh, Nicola Marriott, the HR director, uh, as one of the attendees. Could we please turn over the page, uh, and there's a section on the past roles review. Uh, so was this the first opportunity um, when this matter was discussed after Mr. Jacobs' email at, at, at a board meeting? Yes to the best of my knowledge. Um, so we have there, NR is Mr. Reed. He introduced the matter at the second bullet point. Um, he summarized the new categorizations and employee populations under review. In respect of category one, comprising five current employees due to give evidence at the inquiry within phases five and six, a consistent approach was required in respect of these individuals ahead of and after the inquiry to prevent conflicts arising. Uh, the second category, previously known as past roles, involved reviewing all current employees within the remediation unit, prioritizing those who undertook activity relating to the subject matter of the inquiry in past roles. Uh, and then you have a third category, which included and expanded on the scope of Project Phoenix and we're focused on addressing any misconduct allegations arising against current employees as a result of evidence given at the inquiry in later phases, in addition to evidence provided at the human impact hearings. Uh, so it seems as though the, the scope of Project Phoenix by this stage had expanded um, to go beyond the evidence that was heard at the human impact hearings. Is that right? Yes. Um, Mr. Reid outlined the population and noted that the population could increase uh, with other current employees potentially coming within scope for investigation as a result of evidence heard in phases five and six. Um, Mr. Reid emphasized the need for a consistent and fair approach as well as acting quickly. Uh, Mr. Reid also noted the volume of documents disclosed to the inquiry and that these potentially could be utilized to assist with consistency of approach. Um, the next paragraph, uh, Mr. Reid, um, sorry, um, we now get to Nicola Marriott. Nicola Marriott advised that she wished to provide the board with an update on the current status work undertaken to date and take the board through the proposed next steps. Uh, she reiterated the three categories and the employee populations within these. She spoke through all the work undertaken in relation to Project Phoenix, noting that evidence collected, and she gives, there are various figures there. Um, there have been delays in the ACI team uh, wished to engage with the postmasters who had provided evidence at the human impact hearings that had led to the current employee misconduct allegations. Uh, these meetings had taken a significant amount of time to arrange, and it was not until February 2024 that the first meeting with the affected postmaster had occurred. And, and we then reach the point at which you address or are recorded as addressing the board. Um, SAI is yourself. It says um, that you queried whether that Stephen Bradshaw, um, why Stephen Bradshaw had not been suspended. Uh, and you were advised that the approach taken was to let the misconduct process and the investigations reach conclusion to suspend otherwise was considered very high risk from an employment law perspective. Uh, you expressed your views on the approach and advised that you were receiving comments in from postmasters who were concerned that Mr. Bradshaw remained in the business. Uh, you shared your view 
uh, that this was a cultural issue and the company could not move on until individuals in this category exited the business. Just pausing at that point, can you expand upon your views there? I was getting several postmasters still, still contacting me uh, from a business as usual perspective saying why is Steve Bradshaw still working within the post office and my response was the business is dealing with it and when obviously questioning Nicola Maria about it the approach was to ensure the post office is not exposed to any high risk employment issues and unfortunately that, that was the approach that we had to go with because that's what HR were doing and they were responsible for the project. For me what was really important was this business moves forward and from a cultural perspective to from within the organisation but also to get postmasters back on side. It was really important the business moved on and unfortunately this business redeploys, recycles. There's very, it, it's disappointing when individuals need to be exited, they are not exited. And again, I'm not singling Steve Bradshaw out at all. I'm talking generally on both projects. Um, Ms. Marriott took the point, however advised that in uh, the ongoing investigation into Mr. Bradshaw, no evidence had been found to support the allegations and there was no evidence to date of gross misconduct. Uh, the chair pointed out uh, that there was the evidence of the postmasters had provided in the human impact hearings, so cautioned against the position of stating there was no evidence to support the allegations. Uh, the chair noted that the investigations being conducted were internal and queried if there should be external assurance conducted to validate the approach taken. Uh, what's your view on external assurance in relation to this project? I, I was in agreement with the chair. Um, I think the project, from what I saw since March 23, it just, there, there was a lot of uh, the wider executive mentioning things are going on, we are doing investigations, but there was no uh, hard facts in terms of where the investigations were leading. So if we did go external, it probably would have been executed a lot quicker in terms of a project. It says there, you referenced the meetings with postmasters who'd made allegations against Mr. Bradshaw and queried the level of explanation provided regarding the investigation process. Um, Ms. Marriott noted the employer's duties to protect an employee. In light of this, the approach advised to postmasters had been more general. You queried whether the process could be simplified. Uh, she advised you that engagement had been had with sub-postmasters via their legal advisors, as this is how the, sub -post how the postmasters had advised that they wished to be engaged. Uh, you queried whether there was a time scale for conclusion of the investigations. Uh, she replied that the team had not wished to push too hard, given the sensitivities for postmasters in recounting events. That said, engagement with all the postmasters who had made allegations in relation to Mr. Bradshaw were due to be completed by the end of June. Uh, the team was similarly looking to complete meetings with postmasters in relation to other cases. Um, broadly, were you satisfied with that explanation? No. However, there was no other choice. It was, it was one of them situations where Unfortunately, we had to let the process do what it has to do in, with the right people dealing with it, for example, in this case, Nicola Maria, and we had to let the process happen. There was no way of us getting it done any quicker. Moving on to the past roles project, it says there the, the chair asked Ms. Marriott to provide an overview of category two. Uh, she spoke through the category, outlining the work that had uh, been undertaken to assess the conflicts arising from the roles associated with the activity covered by the inquiry and current roles and detailed the employee population that, had, uh, that this work had identified. She noted proposed restructuring. However, uh, this had not been action due to the need to retain the workforce given the high number of new applications to the historic shortfall scheme. 
Um, so it seems there that some individuals weren't redeployed who had been involved in, in investigations or audits, et cetera, um, because of the work that needed to be covered for the historic shortfall scheme. Is that right? That's correct. And what's your view on that? Disappointing. And we did express myself and Mr. Jacobs' disappointment because, like I said previously, for the organisation to move on, we both believed decisions needed to be made on these individuals who were in Phoenix and past roles. Thank you. If we turn over the page, I'm just going to read a few more passages from these minutes. Um, thank you. The first bullet point there, uh, Ms. Marriott detailed the proposed approaches in relation to the different employee populations within Category 2, uh, noting the benefits and risks involved. Uh, for the 23 red employees, it was proposed uh, that a preferencing exercise was run to understand the appetite for voluntary redundancy or redeployment. Um, can you assist us with who the red employees were? Uh, they not, were the high risk. Not their names, just... No, the high risk employees. Thank you. If we scroll down, um, we have there, on, we can see on the right-hand side, about halfway down, um, it involves yourself again, SI queried whether redeployment was appropriate for red individuals within this population as opposed to exiting these individuals from the business. Uh, Mr. Jacobs agreed with you that redeployment was not appropriate for individuals classified as red. There was discussion regarding how the proposed approach would be executed uh, with Mr. Jacobs querying whether the exercise could be conducted at one time and once uh, and the chair querying the continuation of this population in the business during the consultation period. Uh, Ms. Marriott reminded the board that there was no allegations of wrongdoing in respect of the red population within the remediation unit and that this group were red only because they undertook roles historically linked to the subject of the inquiry. Um, what is your view uh, as to the redeployment of those red individuals? I, I wasn't happy, hence why I, I ensured, I, I told the board of, of my view. And why do you hold that view? Because I, I just don't feel it's appropriate for the individuals who are in the red category to be firstly within the business and I feel it's an insult that they were in the remediations unit. That unit in particular? Yes. Because of the work that they do with sub-postmasters? Co correct. So a, a postmaster who was potentially terminated, wrongly prosecuted, has then got an individual who potentially has done all that damage to them and their life, then giving them a compensation. That just does not sit well with me. Is it one day? Is it one day? Yeah. yeah. So I see time is rolling on. Yeah. I, I think we can return to this document after lunch, so perhaps we'll Certainly. take a lunch break now. Fine. And what time shall we resume? We come back at 10 past two. Fine. Thank you.